now, um, elections have consequences, and you're seeing Democrats control both houses of Congress and the presidency. Could we be seeing uh, this in the future very, very, very shortly? Well, it's very clear that in the House, there's definitely support for the passage of D.C. statehood. Uh, last year, uh, toward the end of the Congress, uh, the House took up that measure for the first time since 1993, and for the first time in history, passed that legislation out of the House, where, of course, it went to the Senate and it promptly died. Uh, but the House, uh, a Delegate Holmes Norton has taken the measure up again, introduced the measure again in the House. Her colleague in the Senate, Senator Harper from Delaware, as you noted with the tweet, filed uh, identical legislation in the Senate. And so now with Democrats in control, uh, there is a hope that uh, the more than 710,000 D.C. residents, of whom I'm one of them, uh, will have full representation in Congress, as well as any rights that a state would have. And John, I was also curious, too, because, you know, D.C. has 700,000 residents that's, you know, less residents than, I believe, the state of Rhode Island, Wyoming. Um, so that's kind of one of the arguments that a lot of D.C. residents and the people uh, in Congress who are for this, um, you know, why shouldn't D.C. be a state if it has a higher population than some states that are already states? Yeah, so we, we in D.C. have more people than Vermont or Wyoming. Uh, I think that's an argument uh, that for the reason why we should. Of course, the Constitution just requires that there be a thousand residents of the state uh, the state could be granted. But, you know, it's, it's more than just the size of our population. Sure, we're, we're smaller than 48 states uh, in the Union, but we pay more federal income taxes than 22 states uh, in the country. Uh, including states that are vastly larger than ours. And so, uh, you know, we're contributing uh, enormous amounts of money to the federal coffers, but we don't have representation in Congress to help direct that funding. In addition, we have issues within this, the District of Columbia uh, that we seek to address, but Congress has a veto power, either directly or by attaching riders to appropriations bills that can literally negate anything that the voters decide by referendum or that our legislature, our city council, decides uh, while in session. And John, also, can we kind of explain uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton's role in Congress? What is a delegate in the Congress essentially? Is it just a, you know, a figurehead, uh, just kind of a symbol? What power do they have? I will say Eleanor Holmes Norton has represented the District of Columbia since 1991. She's a powerful voice the district's interests, and she, in some ways, is part representative and part officer. Her role is going to other members of Congress, advocating for the district, trying to convince them that they should help her residents uh, and American citizens who lack that representation. At the same time, she does have some powers to the She can divorce each other. She can participate in a committee each given. And when Democrats are in control of Congress, they grant uh, the delegates the uh, power to vote in committee. They can't vote on legislation on the floor, but they can vote in committee. When Republicans have control of Congress, they, they remove those uh, committee powers. But that is the extent of her power. And, and so there's an advocacy role and in committee when Democrats are in control. She has a some voting role. But at the end of the day, she can't vote on the final passage of any piece of legislation. And you're, you're hearing a lot of the arguments being made that because of the January 6th uh, Capitol insurrection with all the National Guard troops in D.C., the racial justice protests from last summer, those are some arguments that are kind of, you know, buttressing the cause, if you will, of D.C. statehood. But I feel like a lot of Americans can't even comprehend more than 50 states. Like, what would that even look like? You know, just simply, you'd have to add a star on the flag. Um, we haven't done this since 1959 with, with uh, Alaska and Hawaii. Do you even know what, what this would look like going forward? It would really shift the balance of power as well in the Senate. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, the District of Columbia is a deeply democratic jurisdiction. Uh, we. Uh, as a district voted for Joe Biden, well over 90%. Uh, the same is true for Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama both times. Uh, it's a deeply Democratic place. It will certainly add two Democratic senators to the Senate and one Democratic representative to the House. We're only, we're only large enough to, to send one representative uh, to the House. And so, uh, you know, that will have 
political dynamics, and, and I would argue that is part of the political dynamics of why Democrats are pushing this right now. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, to, to the first part of your question about how can Americans comprehend uh, 51 states, I'd turn that around a little. I, I would say uh, for, for those Americans thinking about that, try to comprehend not having representation in Congress. Try to comprehend what it would be like to uh, not have a senator to call or to call a House member who can't vote on legislation. And so, yeah, it's probably going to take a little getting used to a, a new a new flag and a, uh, you know, a, a new place to learn in grade school. Uh, but at the end of the day, the representation that the 710,000 individuals uh, in this in this city, the majority of whom are people of color, uh, the majority of whom do not work for the federal government, and uh, as a group, as I said earlier, pays an enormous amount of money in federal taxes, deserves better than they're getting. And let's talk about just going forward. Um, frankly, for someone uh, who follows this, um, you could have argued that you know even uh, two or three years ago, this was kind of seen uh, as a pipe dream almost. Uh, and now it is very, very close uh, to happening. What? Um, you know, roadblocks, if any, will Democrats face? Uh, you know, they have the majority in the Senate. We, and we saw uh, last summer it, it passed the House and, like you said, failed and didn't, wasn't even taken up in the Senate. So what is that path looking like legislatively? Um, do you foresee this as a very real possibility this year? So there were a few roadblocks in the, in the previous Congress. The Senate was one and the president was another. President Trump uh, vowed that if D.C. statehood made it to his desk, he would veto it. Uh, now those roadblocks are a little different. Uh, President Biden has said that he would sign D.C. statehood legislation, that he does support that cause. Um, but there are two, two real roadblocks in the Congress. The first is in the House. Uh, the House has a, the Democrats in the House have a much smaller majority than they did when they voted on this in 2020. Um, and while there should be enough votes there, there are 206 co-sponsors of the legislation in the House. And if you count Nancy Pelosi, who is speaker, um, does not co-sponsor any legislation um, as a rule, uh, speakers tend not to, um, that would be 207 votes for it. So they're about 10 votes short, uh, 10 or 11 votes short of what they would need to be just from co-sponsors. Uh, but it's not necessarily a done deal because there were a lot of Democrats who lost their seats in the 2020 election um, who voted for D.C. statehood last year. But if it does get out of the House, which I'll say is probably likely, uh, it moves to the Senate, where uh, Democratic senators, uh, Democratic Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer has voiced support, and he's a co-sponsor of the Pierce Senate legislation, has said he'll take it up. Uh, there are some problems. Not every Democrat is necessarily on board uh, for this. It currently has 40 co-sponsors in the Senate. Uh, and uh, or between the sponsor and the co-sponsor, there's 40 in the Senate, which of course falls short of the 50 votes you need uh, to get the vice president to break a tie. But more than that, it also faces a filibuster. Uh, and uh, DC statehood absolutely does not have 60 votes uh, to pass in the Senate. So Democrats would either have to use reconciliation to pass DC statehood, um, or they would have to try to pass it as attached to other types of legislation, which could be a real poison pill. And uh, John, just a few more questions for you. We are a stream here on News Now, so we have the time to get into the issues. Uh, I was kind of curious as well, just from a personal standpoint, you live in the district. I have family that live in the district. I used to live there myself. Have you ever met someone who isn't in favor, who lives there, or, or local politicians there in the district who, who don't want this? Or is this, what's, what's the breakdown of public opinion where you live? So it's overwhelmingly in favor of, of D.C. statehood. Uh, the polls that I've seen are better than 85 or 90 percent. Um, I personally haven't met someone who's uh, opposed to D.C. statehood. It's, it's hard to understand the dynamics uh, from being a resident, what the costs would be. Uh, my guess is it would largely break down along party lines. Uh, Republicans in the District of Columbia would see benefits uh, from D.C. statehood. They would obviously have representation in Congress but they wouldn't have Republican representation in Congress. And so I think part of what cuts into that support uh, would just be the basic political dynamics of uh, two more Democratic senators in the Senate, one more Democratic House member, and, and the impact that that would have. Uh, in general, uh, you don't see people uh, you know, uh, marching in mass numbers in favor of statehood, but it is something that we think about. It is something that, that people uh, want here in the district. Uh, the leadership of the district obviously wants it. 
We've had great leadership on this issue under uh, Mayor Bowser and, and some of her predecessors. But I think one of the most important things to think about from outside of D.C. is that a lot of people uh, only think of D.C. as the White House, the Capitol, and the National Mall. They think of D.C. residents as just a bunch of federal employees. But the reality is the majority of uh, D.C. residents do not work for the federal government. Um, and that there are uh, dozens and dozens of neighborhoods that most people who have come to D.C. have never stepped foot into. Uh, the District of Columbia is real America, despite what some senators say. And those real Americans, uh, as much as anyone else in any other state from Maine to California, deserve representation in Congress and deserve the freedoms that come with state. All right, John Hudak there, live for us in Washington, D.C., a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Um, John, if we uh, have any more news on this topic, we'd love to speak to you again. Thanks for coming on News Now from Fox. Thanks for having me. All right, really interesting conversation there. Um, because uh, we've had, you know, 50 states uh, since 1959 uh, with Alaska and Hawaii, we, um, that is a long time to kind of shake up that number. Remember, if D.C. statehood did pass, they would get one seat, one extra seat in the Senate, presumably Democratic, and the uh, majority would go up. It would be hard to come to agreement uh, on a lot of things, uh, especially those very, very hard to pass uh, partisan bills. So um, we'll be following all of those developments here on News Now from Fox. Uh, I'm Andrew Kraft. It's almost 7 p.m. here, Mountain Time in Phoenix, Arizona, almost 9 p.m. on the East Coast. We do want to take a quick commercial break, and then we're going to spend the, the 7 p.m. hour, or a large chunk of it, um, talking about uh, the International Remembrance Day for the Holocaust and uh, the liberation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau uh, concentration camp. So we're going to uh, devote maybe 